good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third of the 13 webinars that are part of the 2020 EMOS webinars program. My name is Caterina Giusti. I'm professor of statistics at the University of Pisa in Italy, where this session is hosted. And today, I will also act as the webinar facilitator. Let me first explain for any newcomers that EMOS stands for the European Master in Official Statistics, a joint project of universities and data producers in EU member states, EFTA, and EU candidate countries. If your university is interested in applying for the EMOS label, please consider that a permanently open call for universities is available on the EMOS dedicated page on the Eurostat website. For, any, for staying in contact with the EMOS news and community, please follow the EMOS on Twitter. The EMOS Twitter account is at EU underscore EMOS. I just would like to add that the recordings of the first two webinars, what is a trusted smart statistics and the circular economy, how to measure when we have no measure, are available, are available on the EMOS 2020 events website. And the recording of the first webinar also includes the opening address by Mariana Kotseva, Eurostat Director General. Now, before I give the floor to our speaker, let me first briefly explain how we run the webinar today. As a participant, you can watch and listen to the session. To interact with the presenter, you can use the chat, represented by the comic symbol. We encourage you to prepare your question and post them during the presentation or the question breaks, as we will have some question breaks and the final discussion to reply to the questions. Should you have any technical problem, please try to restart the Skype for Business on your computer or device you are using. For more specific technical questions, you can use the chat and you will receive a personal reply. In any case, please consider that the slides of the presentation are already available on the EMOS 2020 events website. So today, I have a great pleasure to host Professor Natalie Shlomo from the University of Manchester. Natalie uh, Shlomo is Professor of Social Statistics, and her research interests are topics related to survey statistics and survey methodology. She is the UK principal investigator for several collaborative grants for the, from the seventh framework program and Horizon 2020, with all projects involving research in improving survey statistics and dissemination. She is an elected member of the International Statistical Institute and a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. Today, she will present about statistical disclosure control, where do we go from here? A really relevant topic within the EMOS. So Natalie, the floor now is yours until the first question break. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I'm happy you could join me this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, give a bit of background on types of disclosure risks and traditional forms of statistical data, and basically what sort of the national statistical institutes have been doing up till now with respect to their statistical disclosure control methods. I'll talk a little bit about the, the common methods that are used. Uh, I'll talk about how we assess disclosure risk and data utility and the disclosure risk data utility paradigm, which is used basically to make a decision about uh, which uh, method we should use and what are the correct parameterizations of that message. And then we'll have a little break if you have questions about traditional uh, statistical disclosure control. Um, and then I'm going to introduce a new type of disclosure risk called inferential disclosure. Uh, and how that links to the computer science definition of differential privacy. And we'll have a little question break then as well as I define these new terms. Um, and then I'm going to give an example on a new dissemination strategies, which is an on online flexible table builder. Um, you know, certainly agencies are thinking about putting uh, statistical information on the internet, and in fact, in Europe, we have the uh, the EU Census Hub, where you can uh, anyone can go and download census tables, and that's a form of a flexible table uh, builder. 
and uh, mention uh, a few other open data options, and then we'll have a question break. So traditional statistical outputs and statistical disclosure control have traditionally been survey microdata. Now, this is microdata from social surveys. Obviously, we're not releasing uh, whole uh, population counts from censuses or registers. Um, and also business surveys are very, very disclosive because they have very uh, skewed and uh, outline uh, information about businesses. So when I talk about microdata, I'm talking about social surveys. This would be something like the labor force survey um, or health survey or the social survey. And uh, data is generally available on data archives uh, for registered users to download. Another traditional statistical output, of course, is uh, frequency tables uh, coming from our censuses and registers. These would include whole population counts and a lot of effort at National Statistical Institutes is about how we protect these types of tables. Uh, weighted sample counts is another example of a frequency table, although agencies are a little bit uh, less concerned about sample counts because um, you know, the surveys have uh, inherent disclosure control protection by the fact that we took a survey and not, uh, not have um, all the population in these tables. And finally, uh, statistical institutes release magnitude tables. Now, these are business statistics where the, uh, the type of data in a cell of a table is basically an aggregate or a statistic such as total turnover or total profit of businesses. And this has also been traditionally released by national statistical institutes and quite a focus on uh, statistical disclosure control in the agencies. So the types of disclosure risks in these types of outputs are identity disclosure. Identification is widely referred to in our confidentiality pledges, our codes of practice. Uh, we need to worry, uh, you know, assume that we are um, protecting against identity disclosures so that individual uh, cannot be revealed once we release the statistical data. Um, and then we have individual attribute disclosure. So here, confidential information about a data subject can be revealed and can be attributed to the data subject. And obviously, an identification would be a necessary precondition to have individual attribute disclosure. So this is a, a, a cause of concern, for example, when we le release microdata from social surveys, because given I've made an identity disclosure based on you know, uh, identifying variables like their age and their sex, once I make an identification, then I can learn hundreds of variables arising from the survey target uh, variables. Um, and so attribute disclosure is a, a big cause for concern in our social microdata. Finally, we have group attribute disclosures. So this is where confidential information can be learned about a group. Now, you can say I'm not actually revealing a certain uh, attribute for an individual. Rather, I'm revealing an attribute about a group of individual individuals. So it's not necessarily about disclosure risks. Rather, it's more about harm what sort of harm this may cause to a group of individuals. And obviously, the statistical agencies are very worried about their reputation and you know, don't want to have information, sensitive information about groups of individuals being revealed. So these are the three traditional types of disclosure risks that have been underpinning the statistical disclosure control in the last 20 years or so at National Statistical Institutes. So some common um, statistical disclosure control methods, if we look at social survey microdata, as I mentioned, identity disclosure is a, a main cause of concern. Obviously, we don't have names or addresses on our microdata, but we do have a set of um, quasi-identifiers or identifying variables such as your age and your sex and your occupation. And when we can combine all of these categories, we might be able to reveal information about a data subject. Now, you can say that social surveys are, um, you know, not everybody is in the data set. It depends on the uh, selection 
question into the survey. But nevertheless, if we might have very rare categories of identifying variables where an individual would be very unique in the population, um, let's say a 15-year-old widow in a certain area. Um, so basically, the cause of concern in social survey microdata is whether this unique individual in the sample is unique in the population. Okay, so that's the main thing. And obviously, the statistical agencies make a big assumption here. We assume that there's no response knowledge. In other words, some intruder or an attacker of the statistical data would not have knowledge about who is being selected into the survey. Now, as I said, once we have identity disclosure, then we can learn lots of new attributes about the individual through the target variables that are collected in the survey, like their health and their income. So in order to protect against identity disclosure, the common SDC methods, statistical disclosure control methods, would be coarsening those uh, identifying variables, recoding, grouping. We don't allow single years of ages. We only allow um, age bands, say, of five years or 10 years to be disseminated. We would suppress variables such as the uh, geographies, especially the low-level geographies, and maybe only leave um, the, uh, you know, the nuts three variable, the nuts two variables. Um, and also subsampling is another way to uh, protect against identity dis disclosure. And in fact, in many countries, we use um, subsampling to release some microdata from our censuses by, say, releasing only a 1% uh, a uh, sample from the census uh, microdata. That is a way to protect uh, census data by just releasing a small sample. For the attributes like income or the size of your ha uh, household, um, definitely we're using top coding. So, you know, we wouldn't allow uh, Bill Gates in our data set. We would be top coding the highest uh, ranking, the, those with high um, income values. Um, and we might also be recoding or rounding or something called microaggregation, where we only we group uh, data subjects together and only release the average income, not the individual uh, units of income. For frequency tables, loads of research going on in the statistical institutes about how to design census tables. What variables can we use? How should we group the categories that are defining the tables? And there's lots of rules of thumb about the minimum population thresholds that you could have when we disseminate a census table. Now, identity disclosure is very clear in census tables. We don't have to uh, estimate or anything. We can see those cells in census tables that are prone to identity disclosure by the fact that there's only a one or two people in the cell. So one or two people in the cell would be very disclosive. Obviously, if it's a identity disclosure, if there's a single individual in the cell, but the two people in the cell are also disclosive because perhaps the other individual in the cell can, uh, you know, uh, reveal something about the second person in the cell. So ones or twos in generally are uh, avoided, um, and this leads to identity disclosure. In attribute disclosures, very interesting, in census tables, the attribute disclosure is actually caused by zeros. So if you have a row or a column in the table that are all zeros except for one cell, then we can have attribute disclosure. In other words, we can make an identification based on some of the variables defining the, um, the cell, but uh, we can learn something new about that cell based on the um, second or third um, uh, variable spanning the table. So attribute disclosure is actually caused by zeros. If we have a row or column, all of zeros, except for one populated cell. Now, if you have a one in that single populated cell, in other words, a one in the margin, then that means that we have individual attribute disclosure. But you could have 10 or 20 in that populated cell, all the other cells zero. And then we would have an example of group attribute disclosure. So to protect against attribute disclosure, we have pre-tabular methods and post-tabular methods. And these generally are perturbation. We might uh, round values in the table. 
we might um, do other, or we might protect the microdata by doing, for example, record swapping uh, on the microdata, and then from that protected microdata produce the tables. Um, and definitely we worry about nested tables. We don't want to have uh, attackers or intruders being able to difference tables. So the, uh, we would avoid disclosure by differencing, by predefining which categories we will allow to produce the tables. Um, and this is generally what's done for frequency tables of whole population counts. Finally, we have magnitude tables from business statistics. And in fact, statistical disclosure control actually started with these types of tables back in the 80s. Uh, where uh, statistics were released in uh, tables uh, from businesses. And here the assumptions are that the competitor in a cell or another business in the cell might learn something new about another competitor. Um, so businesses uh, in the cell are assumed known. We can just open a phone book and see what businesses are in this particular region under this particular industry code. Um, and we also assume that the ranking of the businesses are known. Uh, but we don't know, uh, it would be sort of what is their profits or what are, what are their turnover, et cetera. Um, and so attribute disclosure here is about what a competitor can learn with sufficient precision about another competing business in the cell. And I'm focusing the, on this a little bit because this is going to lead us to a new type of disclosure risk called inferential disclosure. So to protect my magnitude tables, again, it's all about how we design the tables, minimum population thresholds, but it's also about the distribution of the businesses in that particular cell. Do we have a particular business in a cell where we are um, aggregating total turnover who happens to have a huge turnover compared to the other businesses in, in the cell. So it has to do with the distribution of the um, variable uh, defining the cell across the businesses. You know, if we happen to have the Ford uh, car plant in a cell, a very extreme value, uh, that will um, obviously um, have a lot of disclosure risk to that cell. So a lot of research, basically operations research, on uh, cells, uh, how to protect the cells. These are based on cells that are primary, uh, uh, primary um, uh, disclosure risk. In other words, those cells with minimum population thresholds are one of two, and if they're very skewed distribution. But however, uh, and this is typically done through suppressing the cell. We're just not going to release that particular total. However, it's obvious that in a table, if we suppress the cell, we can still learn what the value of, is, um, of that particular cell simply by looking at the margins. And so the mathematical programming is based on choosing which cells we should secondary suppress in order to protect the primary suppressions. So lots of interesting research there on how we um, develop patterns of cell suppression. Disclosure risks, so for frequency tables, it's obvious what the disclosure risks are. We're looking at, for, at the small cells. We're looking at the placement of the zero cells if they cause attribute disclosure. And in fact, a, a, a term of, called the entropy can identify quite quickly those rows or columns which are all zeros except for one cell which, is, um, which has a positive value. This is caused by um, you know, degenerate distributions, which are easily evaluated through a term called the entropy, which you can see there that H of F over N. So basically, the entropy will have a value of um, um, zero if we have a degenerate distribution or a maximum of log K. K is the size of the uh, number of cells in the row or the column um, when we have completely uniform uh, values in the table. For microdata, as I mentioned, it's about population unique. I might have lots of sample uniques on a cross-classification of identifying variables, 
But if they're not population uniques, I don't have to worry about them. And if I had a census to go along with my labor force survey, I could simply link the labor force survey to the census or to the register to see which one of my sample uniques are population uniques. So you have a formula there where I is an indicator function, yes or no. In this case, we're looking at all of the sample uniques, little fk is equal to 1, that are population uh, uniques, capital FK is equal to 1. Um, and then often we don't have censuses or registered to correlate with our samples that we draw every year. And so there are methods out there uh, using probabilistic or statistical methods to estimate uh, these terms for um, generating disclosure risk measures. For magnitude tables, it's again about the um, whether we have uh, skewed distributions, whether the first N competitors in the business can learn about the total or P percent of the total uh, and get some idea of what the other contributions of the competitors are in the cell. So um, one rule is called the NP dominance rule as defined here. Uh, where the top N contributors are over P percent of the overall total. That would be a disclosive cell and um, subject to primary suppression. Utility, on the other hand, is another type of measure that we need to worry about the, at the statistical institutes. Because obviously, if we're introducing statistical disclosure control methods, this impacts on the quality and the utility of the data. And the utility can be measured in loads of ways, and it very much depends on what the uh, data is going to be used for. You can think of utility measures in terms of the impact on goodness of fit criteria in our regression models or our chi-square statistics, or looking at distance metrics between uh, counts before and after uh, perturbation, et cetera. Uh, this is just an example of a Hellinger's distance looking at the difference between counts that have been uh, protected using a uh, perturbation mechanism. And then finally, what we have traditionally done at the uh, National Statistical Institutes is to produce a map. This is a disclosure risk and data utility map. The y axis is some sort of quantitative measure of disclosure risk that I introduced a few slides ago. And on the x axis is some quantitative measure of the data utility. For example, a distance metric between census tables that have been perturbed versus their original version. And what you can see here is that if I plot uh, these measures, for example, on the original data, you can see that the higher the disclosure risk, the higher the data utility. And typically, the National Statistical Agency will have set a threshold, in this case, a maximum tolerable risk threshold. There are typically microdata review panels or census table panels, and they'll go back to the subject matter people and say, this, you know, this product is too uh, disclosive, go back and do something to it and we'll look at it again. So they might do some of the methods that I've mentioned earlier, bring that disclosure risk measure down so that the release data is below the maximum tolerable risk, risk threshold. However, uh, we, we are um, having some impact on the loss of utility. Notice that on no data, even though the utility is zero, we do have a little bit of disclosure risk, because obviously, if we're not releasing data, that tells us something a little bit about what, what was in the data uh, to begin with. So we draw these uh, risk utility maps. We look at different methods and there are different parameterizations of the disclosure risk measures. And you can see that if we draw a frontier here on this map, uh, the optimal choice will be that particular data set that has been modified, uh, which is below the tolerable risk threshold, but has the highest utility. So that's a rundown, basically, on what traditionally, in sort of 15 minutes, what traditionally we have been doing in statistical disclosure control for the last 20 years or so at the National Statistical Institutes. And this is an opportunity if you have any questions. Yeah, if you have any questions, please, yeah. So we have a first question. At what level can we consider the data disclosure risk to be acceptable? 
Okay, so National Statistical Institutes will typically have microdata review boards and or table boards, and they decide, it's basically policies, they decide, policymakers make this decision on what is the tolerable risk threshold. I should mention, if I go back to this slide, that often this uh, horizontal line here for a maximum tolerable risk threshold is often sloped. Because the agencies will say, well, for a little bit more disclosure risk, I'll have a lot more utility. Um, and so it's very subjective. A lot of times they just have some rules of thumb that they use. Um, whether they're actually using quantitative measures or not, it really uh, depends. I can tell you um, there's never zero disclosure risk. I happen to know from my experiences working at statistical institutes so that for survey microdata, for example, where there is sort of inherent protection because of this assumption that we don't know who's in the sample or not, um, they usually will allow a 1 or 2 percent chance of re-identification using those, that risk measure that I um, identified um, earlier. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, any other questions? Otherwise, we go. Yeah, I think, Natalie, please, you can go. Then we will okay. have another question break on the next part. After, after I introduce the hard notions to you, we will have another question break. So, in the literature on statistical disclosure control, there is something called inferential disclosure. Now, this is a little bit ties back into what I was talking about with the magnitude tables in businesses. Inferential disclosure means that confidential information can be revealed exactly, which is attribute disclosure, or to a close approximation with high confidence. And this is we're able to do by manipulating statistical data or combining it with other data sources. Um, and so it has to do with what an intruder can learn using sort of technical uh, IT approaches to link data and combine the data and difference the data and manipulate those census tables so they can get at the margins, yeah? So uh, one example for is uh, census tables that can be differenced or linked. Now, this type of disclosure risk, you can say, as lo uh, although it's been in the literature, has largely been ignored by the statistical institutes. And why is that? Because statistical agencies dealt with this problem by keeping strict control of the data that is released. In other words, the survey microdata uh, was going into a data archive. You have to register for the data archive in order to gain access to the data. Um, all tabular data, although you might see tables on freely on the uh, census on the statistical agency's um, websites, the tables are heavily vetted. They are hard copy. They're done inside the agency. They're they're vetted. They're looked at. You know, can we not manipulate these data sets? And then only then are they put on the websites for, um, for users to look at. So strict, strict, tight control of data before it is released. And uh, I have lots of experience with Eurostat and then agencies saying, you know, if we're going to release our data to Eurostat, it's only after it's completely protected, right, inside our firewalls, and only then will we release it um, to Eurostat or to archives or to wherever. wherever. So what's happening now in the last uh, five, ten years is that, you know, these assumptions about this control, this strict control that agencies have had may no longer be relevant. Um, and there's a growing demand for more open and accessible data from our governments. The governments are saying the taxpayers are paying for data and we want more web-based open applications to disseminate data. Uh, now, what does this lead to? We have all aspects of our data, of our society already digitalized. We're able to link uh, data sources, and obviously this helps in informing research and evidence-based evidence policies, but this does raise our disclosure risk by quite a bit, right? Agencies are relying a lot more on restricting and licensing, licensing data and actually closing off the data uh, in, in, you know, direct conflict with initiatives to have more open and accessible data. So 
when we are thinking about opening data, we need to think about more rigorous data protection mechanisms with stricter privacy guarantees. And this has led statisticians like me to uh, collaborate with computer scientists through several scientific programs that we've had in the past. So this uh, notion of inferential disclosure is actually grounded in a, a definition that came about from the computer scientists called differential privacy. Now, the earliest work there were back in the 10,000s, but I'm giving the, particularly this reference to work at Roth 2014 because it's a very nice book that explains very well the differential privacy. And by the way, in the last slide, there'll be references that you can look at. So in the computer science uh, differential privacy, their disclosure risk uh, um, type is, you know, it's not identity disclosure, not attribute. It's about a particular worst case scenario. So their definition of disclosure risk is that the intruder, the attacker, has knowledge of the entire database. Hello? Hello? Yeah, that's heavy. Yeah, I can't see. OK, sorry, I had a different window. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay. the entire database uh, is known except for one person. Now, this is where it goes way beyond identity disclosure and attribute disclosure. I know everything about um, everybody in the population except for one individual. So to define differential privacy, um, a mechanism, it's about defining a perturbation mechanism M, um, satisfies epsilon delta, I'll leave the delta out for a minute, Sat uh, satisfied epsilon differential privacy. If we look at all neighboring databases, a neighboring database has to be uh, a particular database D, and then a neighboring database without one individual. So it only differs by one individual, D and D tag. Now, if I look at all possible queries based on this perturbation mechanism, MQD, and I observed an output, S, I will not be able to distinguish that output on if it came from database D or if it came from database D tag. So the outputs, S, are indistinguishable. I get a result. I'm an attacker. I see the result. For example, I asked for average income in Italy, and the uh, server gave me back the average income in Italy plus noise. And I don't know. I won't be able to distinguish if that output that I observe came from D or D tag without my data, yeah? Now, the, uh, in other words, if we look at this term here, the um, output is indistinguishable by up to a privacy uh, measure, which is E to the epsilon. So there is a little bit of a, a slippage there from E to the epsilon, and obviously we want epsilon to be very small. And epsilon is known as a privacy budget in the differential privacy um, literature. Now, the computer scientists have also um, included a delta, which we're going to need as statisticians. This gives us a little bit more utility in this definition. So in other words, we're going to allow a little bit of slippage. Um, and this will, I'll show you a perfect example of this in the application following the next question session. So the idea is that, okay, maybe we will have an unbounded, if you can think of that as a ratio, an unbounded ratio, but if the probability of that is tiny, 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 uh, we will allow the slippage. And that led us to epsilon delta differential privacy. So one way in the computer science to protect queries, and I, I actually, it, it, it was basically started as an output query uh, protection mechanism, a perturbation mechanism for output queries. For example, I want to know average income in Italy. And the idea with the computer scientists is to add noise, as I uh, mentioned um, earlier. And uh, they're using, instead of the normal Gaussian noise, which we would use in statistics, they're using a double exponential or a Laplace noise. And here you've got some figures of the Laplace noise. Let's ignore the pink one because that's biased. We obviously want this noise to be centered on zero. So on, uh, on average, you know, the uh, estimates that we get back are unbiased. 
Um, but they have different ranges of uh, variances, the spread of the Laplace. And obviously, the more spread out they are, the more noise we will be adding to the query. So you can ask, OK, well, how much noise do we need? Well, the noise is going to be dependent on our privacy budget epsilon and something called a sensitivity. A sensitivity Q is denoted delta Q. And this says I'm going to look at all possible queries. For example, if I'm looking at average income, all possible queries between my two databases, the original database and the database without each individual included, D and D tag, and I'm going to look for that maximum value. So if I was asking for the average income, I would look for the largest income divided by N. In this case, you can see uh, max age would be 120, or the average age 120 over N, where N is the size of the database. So this defines the sensitivity. It basically says, if I'm applying this query to D and D tag, what would be the maximum value? And uh, if we think about uh, tables of census counts, and I move an individual in and out of the database, obviously the difference in a cell will be a count of one, so the sensitivity is one. And in the differential privacy, the settings, uh, if we set the scale, uh, the variance, the scale B of Laplace noise to delta Q of over epsilon, this ensures epsilon uh, differential privacy. Now, in the computer science literature, they also have something called an interactive mechanisms where you have databases that people can query. And each time they query the database, the response comes back with the noise. And if you keep querying again and again and again, you're going to get more and more and more and more noise. And therefore, the queries have to be monitored. Um, in the uh, on the other hand, you have something called a non-interactive mechanism where we actually protect the outputs first before they are subject to the queries. So the data custodian, or the agency in this case, produces a safe object, and this object is safe. And then we can put that on the uh, internet. And then all possible queries will be protected if the original uh, database was protected uh, using differential privacy mechanisms. And in this case, of course, no privacy budget is spent. You can go and query that database as much as you want. So non-interactive mechanisms are relevant for statistical agencies. There's no need to monitor the queries. Um, and the differential privacy is actually coming into place when we're thinking about web-based open dissemination strategies. This is why the statisticians are starting to look at uh, differential privacy as an additional element to our disclosure control uh, toolkit. Um, a main difference between differential privacy and disclosure control is that we need to worry about zeros. So I don't. if those of you who have experience, when we look at census tables and we have zeros, the uh, sort of random zeros, uh, certainly structural zeros like 15-year-old uh, uh, doctors, we're not we don't have to touch those. But if there happens to be no doctor in a particular village, but there could be, that's defined as a random zero, those zeros have to be perturbed. Um, so that's a big difference between differential privacy and, um, and the uh, statistical disclosure control. Also, I should mention in differential privacy, a huge advantage is that the um, uh, parameters is not, are not secret. We can release the B, the, the noise of the Laplace mechanism. We can release the parameters of the perturbation mechanism. And users know how to use this. The minute they have the variance of the noise, they know how to adjust their statistical analysis for measurement error caused by the perturbation. So this, as I said, is a huge advantage to differential privacy in that it's grounded in cryptography. And the parameters of the noise are not um, hidden. Any questions on that? Yeah, we already received a question. Uh, so let's see if we understood it correctly. So I was wondering how you collecting data, for example, for your island, which jurisdiction are the islands Scotland? For example, city of Zara 
Croatia as under its jurisdiction seven islands with inhabitants and they are part of the city. Uh, and they are very developed according to statistical data, but unfortunately there is no basic infrastructure and islands are not yet been developed. Data are completely wrong. What would you be your recommendation average income for each island? So maybe this is more a question on data availability. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, we are. Nice to see looking forward. So I, again, as I said, um, um, it is true that uh, certainly in Great Britain, it is true that Scotland ha might have different sort of disclosure risk to tolerable risk thresholds different than uh, England and Wales, for example. That that does uh, happen. Um, so, uh, so, so what would be the level of noise? I mean, if we add to perturbed um, income, it could be that Scotland has different risk thresholds than uh, England and Wales, and uh, you know, we would be uh, uh, have to accommodate those different uh, disclosure risk um, risk thresholds uh, according to the country. And how do we combine them? It, it actually is a bit of a um, uh, a good question. So certainly in Scotland, they have different uh, tolerable risk thresholds for their census data than England and Wales, and this does cause some um, problems when we're looking at um, aggregating of the whole of Great Britain. I can tell you that in the EU census hub, uh, where every member state has to put together 150 huge multi-dimensional census tables to put in the census hub. It was a problem last time because every country was doing their own thing to protect the census tables. Um, and I know that this time there is an, uh, a group of uh, statisticians from the uh, National Statistical Institutes in, in Europe that are trying to harmonize a common method so that all the countries would use the same method so that they, you know, so that you are able to aggregate uh, information across um, countries. Anyways, let's so, move on. I want to talk about an yeah, we have a, Sorry, Natalie, we have just another question. What, maybe, yeah, we can address this at the end, is uh, what would you consider to be the best method for statistical disclosure control looking forward? So do you prefer to leave it as the, at the end? Um, I, as I said, if you're doing sort of, I don't want, uh, what I'm describing here, I'm not trying to negate any of the st standard statistical disclosure control methods that have been done up till now. You know, the, the approaches that are used for survey microdata, for the hard copy census tables, you know, magnitude tables. I think, you know, all the, we, sh we shouldn't lose sight of what we've done up till now. And also, of course, the remote, the safe access approach where researchers can go to data enclaves, trusted users can go to data enclaves and, ha enclaves and have access to data. And I don't, I don't think we should lose sight of that. But looking forward, the uh, National Statistical Institutes will have to put more open data on the internet. And this is why uh, we're thinking about differential privacy in our statistical disclosure control toolkit. So it depends, again, where you're disseminating the data and what uh, methods you have to, um, to safeguard the data. And certainly, if you're going to be thinking about flexible um, data or open access data, we have to use the perturbation methods. In fact, traditionally, perturbation methods were very rarely used. Maybe on the census tables, there was some rounding on the census tables, but very rarely they were used. Um, but once we think about data on the internet, now we have to be careful, right? Now we have to think about perturbation. So this application is online, flex, online flexible table builders. I said there's an increasing demand for census dissemination. And in fact, um, the AA Australian Bureau of Statistics has a table builder. The United States has a table builder. And of course, we have the EU Census Hub. Everybody can go and um, look at the EU Census Hub. These are web-based platforms. So there is a bit of control in these um, on the, in these platforms, the, the, typically the variables and the categories of the variables are available using drop-down lists, 
And there's controls about population thresholds and no sparse tables are allowed. And the SDC is typically done on the fly. Uh, there could be pre-tabular methods. For example, the, e, the EU um, Census Hub uses pre-tabular methods because it requests all the member states to use hypercubes or these big multi-dimensional tables. I think there's about 150 of them. And basically, if you want to aggregate these tables, um, that's all fine. But you won't be able to aggregate a table that's below the level of the cell that was defined. Or if there are variables that are across different tables, you will never be able to um, aggregate those. Um, but typically, uh, post-tabular methods are used, like um, adding noise. This is the method for the Australian Bureau of Statistics. and. Uh, uh, and a method that uh, we're going to focus on because this will lead us to the differential privacy paradigm. So in the Australian Bureau of Statistics method, we have a perturbation um, vector, a mechanism. It's sort of like a rounding procedure, but it's got longer probabilities to it. And I'll show you some examples soon. But basically, we're going to define a probability, a probability that if the original cell value is i, what is the probability that we're going to change it to j? So PIJ. Now the diagonals PII are going to assume pretty, or should be relatively high, right? We're not going to change a lot of the cells, but we're going to use this probability mechanism and start flipping coins to decide whether the cell value I should be changed to a cell value J. Um, and of course, there are lots of principles when this was developed at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And one method I want to mention is how the um, Australia Bureau of Statistics dealt with consistency problems. Now, you know if I'm independently adding noise to a single table and I'm able to, or a single cell, and I keep um, asking more and more and more for the same cell hundreds of times, I can simply take the average of the noise, average of these uh, values that I get and average out the noise, right? Because the noise is centered with an expectation of zero. So the main problem in the table builder was that we don't want to independently add noise because then we can just average out the noise. Remember, these are tables that are freely accessible to users. The users can go and ask for the same table a hundred of times, hundreds of times. So what they developed was something called a microdata key. Basically, on the microdata of the census, every individual has a key. And if the key is, if the cell is requested or aggregated, then so is the key. So anytime I group uh, individuals together to form a cell of the table, I'm also grouping their key. And that tells me how to perturb the cell. So it forms the seed of the cell. So anytime I group the same cell together, I will always perturb it the same way. So this has led us to an interesting paper uh, by looking at that approach and the differential privacy approach for flexible table builders that just came out in 2018. So take a look at that reference. And this is what I'm going to describe to you now, is to use that ABS approach of having this consistency basically mean that I can, I can define a differential privacy with the privacy budget of epsilon um, and Basically, this is a non-interactive mechanism. And any time a user comes and, and requests a table, they will always get the same perturbation back. So there's no privacy budget to spend. So uh, exponential or differential privacy mechanism is by um, defining probabilities proportional to this term here, the exponential of epsilon over 2 times u, which is the uh, query, uh, maximal query, in this case is 1, and uh, is the maximal um, uh, U is the um, difference between the original and perturbed cell. And delta U, in this case, for census data, the sensitivity is 1, as I described. Now, how do we think, look about the, um, think about the utility here is that, um, obviously, the statistical agencies will not perturb cells by too much. Right? Statistical agencies wouldn't take a cell of size 10 and turn it into 10,000. So basically, these uh, cells, if the original cell count is AK and the observed perturbed cell count is BK, they will be kept. 
For example, we're not going to allow a cell to move by more than plus or minus 7. So I'm just showing you here some examples of what this perturbation mechanism described above looks like under an epsilon of 1.5 versus an epsilon of 0 0.5 and different values of delta. So what delta means is that at the cap, I do not allow any more perturbations. So this is telling me where that slippage is on that uh, likelihood ratio that I showed you and the definition of differential privacy. So, for example, at 7, the probability of um, adding a 7 when the case of epsilon is 1 and a half, we have 0 0.00002. So that's the delta. And beyond 7, we have a probability of 0, right? We're not going to allow any value above the cap. So that tells us what the delta is. And you can see the delta is very, very, very tiny. We're going to allow a little bit of slippage, but a lot of utility by putting that cap in the perturbations. Now you can see for one and a half, 63 and a half percent of the cells will not be perturbed, right? And then 14% uh, will get a minus one, another 14% plus one. If I want an epsilon of 0.5, right, 25% will not be perturbed, and the rest will uh, be spread out um, plus minus 7. Um, I'll just skip this uh, slide because we're lo losing time. So as you can see, and according to the perturbation mechanism, if I have small cells, I might get negative values in my uh, B, in the outcomes. And of course, if we do have negative values when we're perturbing the tables, we can um, push those to zero. That doesn't change our differential privacy mechanism. Again, the zeros have to be perturbed. There's implications about internal cells and margins because, the, as I said, the sensitivity when we move an individual in and out of a cell is one. However, in a table, if I have margins, right, then the individual can appear several times in the table. So this has implications about the amount of noise and the delta U. Um, but the most important thing, of course, is that the differential privacy parameters are not secret. I can tell the users what the uh, perturbation is, and they can account for that in their statistical analysis. Certainly for uh, tables, we're looking at um, chi-square tests for independence and log linear modeling, et cetera. Just a, a couple examples. This is tables that are generated that had independent attributes, because that's the hard one. With, when they have independent attributes, we know that if a table has independent attributes and we start adding perturbations, this weakens the independence. But you can see here uh, our risk utility maps, although it's a little backwards because the utility is on the y-axis. These are p-values, the Kramer's v, chi-square statistics, and, and a distance metric. And the x-axis are different values of the epsilon. And you can see as the epsilon gets bigger, especially when it gets up to the value of 2 or 3, uh, it has little impact on our inference for the p-value, chi-square, Kramer's v. Uh, but for very small values, we do um, lose a lot. Now, on the right-hand side, we have normal perturbations, not the Laplace, which is typically what the statisticians would do. And I just left those in there to show you that actually the Laplace mechanism is adding a lot less noise than the normal perturbations. Now, of course, if we have very sparse tables, as you can see here, with an average cell size of 10 versus 100 on the previous cells, then we can, you know, might do quite poorly. And we have to consider... Um, again, using those parameters of the differential privacy to adjust our chi-square statistics. And in that statistical science paper, we actually show how that can be done for a chi-square test for independence. But just to mention that if we have real census data where there's lots of ta um, in dependencies anyways, in this case, I'm looking at a real table from the UK census, which is about age and occupation. And obviously, these are highly correlated. We can still do pretty well, even with an epsilon of a uh, size of one, you know, on our real tables, one and a half. So this sort of tells us a little bit about how much um, uh, risk thresholds or privacy budgets, risk thresholds we can think about in terms of a maximal tolerable risk threshold, which gives us enough utility. So other, um, we don't have time, I just really focused on the table builders because, again, this is relevant for the EU Census Hub. 
This is a method um, that is uh, highly appropriate to the uh, all the member states that are producing these 150 hypercubes. Although they, I should mention that this perturbation mechanism should not be done on the hypercubes. It should be done in the package that generates the table. So the user would generate the smaller table. They're not interested in these huge hypercubes. And then the perturbation would be done on the generated tables, not on the hypercubes. And I do know that the group are looking at ways to protect the hypercube, which is basically lowers the utility uh, considerably when you do that. Other methods, again, are thinking about synthetic data. Uh, in other words, we, uh, for survey microdata, we can model the data, generate new data, and put that on the internet. This is useful to inform what the data looks like, because ultimately researchers will be able to get access to the data through the data enclaves. But this way, the process takes a while, and this way they can look at the uh, different data, they can try out their models uh, on synthetic data. Another way to produce open access data on the internet. And finally, uh, another approach is to extend the table builders by allowing more exploratory analysis, by looking at regression models. There's no reason why we can't go beyond the tables to consider a remote analysis servers. So for example, in this example, we did a regression model. On the bottom here, you have what the output would look like in a remote analysis instead of a scatter plot, which would be quite disclosive. But we can think about using the sequential box plots uh, versus the scatter plots. So thinking about going a step further and looking at remote analysis. Finally, differential privacy with formal privacy guarantees can be an added toolkit to our uh, to the Statistical Disclosure Control Toolkit. Um, and it allows the statistical agencies to consider new ways of opening data on the internet. It allows the government initiatives for open data. And when combined, of course, with our other SDC approaches of coarsening and subsampling, this will impact on the privacy budget, obviously, whatever pre-tabular methods we put in. Um, and so it's a very useful way to consider uh, statistical disclosure control when we need to focus on inferential disclosure. And actually, we saw that the uh, additive noise on di differential privacy can be a lot less than some of our noise perturbation on statistical disclosure control, which we would have done typically using the normal noise. Um, and as uh, finally, the agencies are able to release the parameters of the perturbation, the parameters of differential privacy, and we can use those to adjust our analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So now we have time for uh, some questions, if any, uh, on the presentation, of course. So if you have other questions in general. So we have uh, a question. Had the plans to train an size officer regarding the application of the new methods? So that's a good question. Uh, I think it was a year ago or two years ago, we had an uh, uh, ECAS. Course. It was uh, done at ENSE and REN in France, and uh, it was based on statistical disclosure control and differential privacy. ECAS is the European Courses in Advanced Statistics. So watch out for that if, uh, you know, this comes up um, again. Um, and since then, I have been teaching uh, statistical disclosure control and differential privacy and the EMOS program at ENSE. So I don't know if there's opportunities to, to exchange students across the EMOS institutions, but I do deliver this course in NSA. I've been doing it the last two years, and uh, hopefully I'll give it again next year. So watch out for that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Let's see. No. So, uh, as I said, I, I, I'm a bit different. Now, I should mention that the United States Census Bureau, are you going to be using only differential privacy now in all of their census outputs? 
Um, and there's uh, so this is really the start, you know, this big application to see if it's really going to work. So all our eyes now are on uh, the United States Census Bureau to see if there, um, you know, if this differ differential privacy um, will be um, a success. So as I said, it hasn't really been implemented large scale. It will be implemented in the United States. Um, as far as the European perspective goes, as I said, we are looking at differential privacy application by application. It's not about, you know, all of our dissemination being connected uh, and one privacy budget for the whole agency for all products. We're not going that overboard, but we do think that application by application, there is scope to include the perturbation methods of uh, differential privacy, especially for open data uh, problems. Um, and uh, as I said, it's very similar to the methods we've been using up till now, except the way that the noise is defined, whereas traditionally we would use Gaussian noise and the noise would be sort of functions of the data itself in terms of their um, mean and variances of sufficient statistics. Here the noise is completely independent of the data. The only thing that depends on the noise and differential privacy is that sensitivity. What is the maximal query that I would be able to get with or without an individual? That's why the uh, parameters are not secret and we can release these parameters for users to, um, to um, adjust for measurement error in their analysis. So we have another question. Do you think that statistical disclosure controls should be inserted in the required quality profile of any official data? I guess, especially in this deluge, that data deluge time. I absolutely think that agencies need to be transparent and definitely as part of the quality profile. The problem is, is that statistical agencies will not tell you uh, much about the disclosure control. And that's the problem. They will say maybe they did a little bit of uh, record swapping or they might say a little bit about the method, but they would never tell you how much or which data is affected, uh, which is the big problem in, in uh, statistical disclosure control. Everything is very secret. Um, so although there could be some generic uh, words out there in data dissemination about um, how the data was protected, uh, they won't tell you anything about the variance of the noise or how, you know, what 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 levels of perturbation were done or what exactly how the top coding was done or the, what is the base of the rounding, although that could be obvious. Um, so in any case, it's very problematic, uh, the traditional statistical disclosure control. And as I said, most of the uh, disclosure control in the past was about controls, right? This The idea now is to try to open our data. Okay, yeah, thank you. Indeed, this is really interesting, I think. So if we have no more questions, I think we can close our webinar. So thank you, Natalie, very much for this insightful lecture. And of course, many thanks also to all our participants who joined us today from many different places. So you can already download the presentation from the EMOS 2020 events website, where the recording of the webinar with will be also available as soon as possible. And in the meantime, I kindly ask you to check the inbox of your email account, the email account that you use for registering to the webinar, as you have already received the link to a short survey about today's webinar. We'd really appreciate your feedback to further improve our webinars. The next webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, 18 of March, when Jens, Jens Merfrov from Deutsche Bundesbank will be presenting on consumer price indexes from traditional to new data sources and techniques. So thank you again, Natalie. Thank you to all uh, the people participating and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.